Well, hi everybody. It is great to see you, even though frankly, I can't actually see you. We are continuing our series this weekend, What Just Happened? We're looking at amazing jaw-dropping episodes that unfold in the Bible, Old and New Testaments. This weekend, our theme is Hope Just Happened. We're looking at the character of Daniel. Uh, obviously, his story is told in the book of Daniel. And I know a year or two ago, we had an entire series based around Daniel, but at this particular time that we're all navigating through, we felt it would be good to return to his story. Hope just happened. You know, when you travel internationally, culture can be so confusing. And I've talked many times here in Timberline about some of the the, the differences in culture between the USA and the UK and some of the confusion that we experienced when we first came to America and frankly, the confusion that continues to this day. Here where the sidewalk is what we Brits call the pavement and what you call the pavement is a road where a biscuit isn't a cookie and where if you congratulate a lady for being really homely, she probably won't be totally thrilled. In England, that means friendly and hospitable. Homely here means something quite different. I am reliably informed. Even when you say thank you and the response in, in America is you're welcome. We don't say that in the UK. So I came here, I'd say thank you. They'd say you're welcome. I'd say thank you. I'd, you're welcome. Thank you. You're welcome. I thought we're going to be here for about three weeks. When I went to Australia and I love Australia and the Australians, I discovered that they end their sentences by going up in tonal inflection. So I'm going to the grocery store to get uh, an ice cream and maybe fill up the car with gas. And I'm thinking, are you asking a question? And is there something else to come? This is all endlessly bewildering. The differences in culture can be all very confusing. Now, imagine this. You are living happily here in Northern Colorado and life is comfortable and happily predictable and war suddenly breaks out and a totally unexpected defeat comes at the hands of a foreign power. Ground troops invade the USA, this country that you thought was yours. They are swooping across the land like ravenous locusts and you are terrified as you view doom-laden news flashes because, frankly, the headlines are apocalyptic and rumors abound about the brutality of the advancing soldiers. They're coming close to where you live. And at last, the dreaded day dawns. The enemy soldiers arrive. They pound on your door. They tell you, pack your things right now. You are leaving. Not only are you now homeless because your home doesn't belong to you, but you are being deported to an alien, foreign land where the culture is utterly different. That's exactly what we see when we turn to a story that unfolded 2,600 years ago, 600 years before Christ. Daniel and his young friends, that's what happened to them? They were deported, probably as hostages, to the strange land of Babylon. And there, everything was different. The music, the food, the customs, the religion, the philosophy, the education, the values, everything utterly foreign. And now this young man, whose name Daniel means God is my judge, he is called up in this nightmare of judgment, the judgment of God upon his wayward people. Now, a couple of things we need to know. First of all, Daniel would have been young. The Hebrew word uh, used to describe him and his three friends is yeladim. It's normally used for lads. They may have been between 12 uh, to 14, at very most 18. Nebuchadnezzar, the Babylonian king, demanded young impressionable minds for training in a rigorous training program. They're young. And then they find themselves in the most intimidating boomtown city. Historians describe this opulent designer city of Babylon built on both sides of the river Euphrates. 
Euphrates. It was the greatest and the largest city in the world at that time, 200 miles square, surrounded by a double fortified wall, 250 towers at strategic intervals, 56 miles of walls, 80 feet thick, 320 feet high. Think of it. Think of what it felt like to be led into that city. And then you look up and the skyline of the city is dominated by the Et Menarche, the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth, a seven-story building dedicated to a foreign god, the skyscraper of its time around 299 feet high, a staggering feat of engineering. And then you explore the city if you're able. And there are parks and fields and gardens over 90% of the city is filled with them, public buildings, over a thousand temples, the famous Hanging Gardens, one of the wonders of the world, situated in Nebuchadnezzar's palace. And here's the thing, in those days it was believed that if you lost to a foreign power, it wasn't just that you lost, it was rather that their God beat your God. Nebuchadnezzar had taken the precious things from the temple of Jerusalem and taken them back to his own museum, if you will, in Babylon. That wasn't just about display. It was about a proclamation of victory. I beat you and my God is bigger than your God. And so these young men are led into this alien environment. What's going to become of them? what they really needed, and what we really need at a time like this is hope. Authentic, genuine, biblical hope. Not catchy slogans. Not, a, it'll be okay. We'll get there in the end. No, they needed to have their feet set on a firm foundation of hope, that their God was not beaten, that he had not lost control, that when they were shoved into Babylon, God located himself with them and was powerfully at work among them. And in fact, in that place of displacement, Daniel received some of the greatest revelation in human history. He's placed in a second choice, choice world, in a place where he wouldn't want to be. But in that place, God gave him hope. Let's pause for a moment here and realize that that's exactly what we need. I cannot begin to contemplate the different challenges that you perhaps might be facing right now. These challenges are not theoretical. They're about perhaps your job or your business, your children struggling to keep up with their education in these difficult times and just feeling penned in by all of the restrictions and the, some of the frustration is spilling over perhaps into the family, into your marriage if you're married and there's this reservoir within you of sadness. What hope do we find in this story? Well, let's, let's have some troubling news first of all, if I may. Let's say this, bad things happen to good people. Yes, bad things do happen to good people. Daniel 1, 1 and 2, in the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. And the Lord delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hand, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. Then he carried off to the temple of God, to the temple of his God in Babylonia, and put in the treasure house of his God. I've been in church gatherings where the preacher gave the impression that if you just put God first, you're just going to have a great life and you won't really have any difficulties at all. I remember 
being in one of those services and the rhetoric was fast flowing. The preacher said, you're going to be the head and not the tail. Triumphant over the circumstances, not cowed down by them. Strong and healthy, not withered by sickness. Financially prosperous, never ever short of cash. And I thought, yes, please. And I think the congregation were all saying, amen, we'll, we'll have some of that. But then I looked over at Sue, and Sue has been using a wheelchair for some years now, and I saw the sense of quiet despair in her eyes because for her, multiple sclerosis is her daily experience, and she's been prayed for for healing but it hasn't happened. And then I looked at Bill, who's been unemployed for a long time, and he's given his life to loyally serve the same company, but the time came for a reshuffle. They had to cut costs, and now he feels like he's passed his sell-by date. I looked at John and Christine. They are doing so well in both of their careers, and they're living the American dream. They've got a beautiful house and no shortage of money, but they, they really struggle to sleep at night because their son has marched away from Jesus and is playing fast and loose with hard drugs. You see, when you look around, when you look past the expression on people's faces, you realize that actually bad things happen to really good people people. And the Bible doesn't back away from that reality. In the book of Ecclesiastes, we hear the complaint, why do the wicked prosper while the righteous suffer? And we know that that is true, that life is not a bank where if you invest some goodness, you're going to get a dividend of trouble-free days. Life isn't fair because we live on a broken, a broken planet and there's so much injustice and so much pain. But you see, Daniel and his friends were not paralyzed by their new situation and they didn't shake their fists at heaven and abandon their faith as some of the exiles, some of their fellow Jews did there in Babylon. They chose another pathway of trust and prayer and faithfulness. Here's a question. Are we mad with God because he didn't give us what he never promised to give us? He never promised us a difficulty-free life. In fact, in John 16, Jesus says, in this world you shall, you will have trouble. Bad things happen to bad people. Secondly, our, ident our identity in Christ will be contested. Our identity in Christ will be contested. We we see an identity conflict in Daniel 1.7. The chief official gave them new names to Daniel, the name Belteshazzar, to Hananiah, Shadrach, to Mishael, Meshach, and to Azariah, Abednego. Do you remember that? Uh, are you familiar with that famous story of Les Miserables, now a brilliant um, stage play, a pretty good film? Um, the story of Jean Valjean, the, uh, the classic story written uh, by Victor Hugo, set in France in the 1820s. This, this man is labeled by a number. He is simply prisoner 24601. And his nemesis, uh, Gervais, he constantly pursues this man. And he never refers to him by name. It's always, you're just a number. In Albania, they took people's names very seriously. And right after the Second World War, they insisted that everybody albanize their names. You see, your name is precious to you. I mean, I say that just as a side note. My name is not precious to me. I've said it before. Jeffrey, I, I, I'm not thrilled with it to me. And if your name is Jeffrey, please forgive me. To me, it sounds like a children's puppet. But to most people, their name is precious. And their names are changed. And they're being dislocated from their core identity. We know from the book of Ezra that when the king, when Nebuchadnezzar sacked the temple, 
he took at least 5,400 items and placed them in that museum that I mentioned earlier. I wonder whether Daniel and his friends visited that museum, not just out of nostalgia, but because they wanted somehow to connect with the story that they'd lost back in Jerusalem. We need to know that our identity will be challenged as well. Our identity in Christ. We read in Luke's gospel that the father identified, or, or celebrated, I should say, the identity of Jesus at baptism. This is my beloved son, Luke chapter three. Identity confirmed, celebrated. And then right away in Luke chapter four, we see identity undermined as Satan says, if you are the son of God. You see, God says, this is who you are. And Satan says, who do you think you are? Our identity matters. That's why as we worship together, as we open the scriptures, as we break bread, as we share in small groups, as we pray and reflect upon the truth that we know about Christ as Lord, the only way, as we affirm that we belong to him, we remember who he is. And in remembering who he is, we remember who we are and whose we are. Before we move on, let's realize that whether it's church online or church shared together in these challenging days where we have to respect each other's choices in all of that and, and know that we fully understand that many cannot gather, gather at the moment because of concerns for health and safety. But however we do it, let's not lose our grip on the importance of fellowship together because that fellowship strengthens our identity in these troubling days. Thirdly, we're called to bless our city. We're called to bless our city. We read in Daniel chapter 1 and verse 17, to these young, four young men, God gave knowledge and understanding of all kinds of literature and learning. And then later on we read, in every matter of wisdom and understanding about which the king questioned them, the king found them 10 times better than all the magicians and enchanters in his whole kingdom. And Daniel remained there until the first year of King Cyrus. By the way, that means he stayed there his whole life. His whole life was spent in a second choice. But as one writer says, Stranded in exile, they headed for the center of the volcano, the heart of the storm, the vortex of all their fears. And they decided to bless this godless city with the gifts that God had given them. This is so important because you see, Christians can either resort to something called syncretism, which is where we just blend in with the culture, or separatism, where we just try and get away from the culture. Daniel and his friends didn't do that. They affirmed their identity. There were certain compromises that they would not take, like, for example, about the food that they consumed. But they determined not to just become like the Babylonians or separate themselves from them, but rather to serve and bless the new culture in which they found themselves. You know, often when people talk about the Christian church, we look back at the so-called horrible histories of the church, some of the terrible things that have been done in the name of Jesus. I think it's important for us to remember that the church historically has also been a huge blessing to the world. The church has given great teaching that has given the world a better view of marriage and sexuality and family life, in some places outlawing the horror of human sacrifice, infanticide, and polygamy, providing education, health care in, in many countries. Artists have been inspired, philosophers provoked to think because of the church. As Daniel did, we can bring the wisdom of God because as followers of Jesus, we claim to be the followers of the one who really knows how life works and how to do life because he is the designer and the creator. We bring truths about friendship and leadership and money management. We have practical teaching that can help the world when it comes to forgiveness and reconciliation. In South Africa, when the terrible scourge of apartheid ended, the nation turned 
to Bishop, Bishop Desmond Tutu for help and the formation of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission helped the country to heal. They turned to the church. Let me elaborate just a little more. We are able to bring a message about a life with purpose, one worth sacrificing for, one even worth dying for, bringing the answers to many questions, the ability to trust when we don't understand, to endure when life is toughest. We bring truth, and it's not my truth, or your truth, because there's no such thing as individualized truth. Something is either true or it is not true. And in the Christian message, we hold out the claims of Jesus to a world that needs answers. Daniel and his friends blessed their world. We have the opportunity to continue as a Timberline family to bless Northern Colorado, this nation, and the wider world. And thank you to everybody who gives and serves to be, if you will, a blessing in Babylon. And don't just think about programs. Because you see, we can bless our communities, our neighborhoods, that, that house three doors down where you know that elderly person is living alone, that, that neighbor who is really struggling at the moment. We can serve and bless Babylon. Well, fourthly, hope is based on trust and not preferred outcome. Let me explain that. Daniel chapter 3, 16, it's the, it's the famous fiery furnace story. Daniel's not actually involved. Commentators believe that he would have been away on state business at this time, and so the summons had not reached him, the summons to bow the knee. And here's what we read. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego replied, King Nebuchadnezzar, we do not need to defend ourselves before you in this matter. If we are thrown into the blazing furnace, the God we serve is able to deliver us from it, and he will deliver us from your majesty's hand. But even if he does not, we want you to know, your majesty, that we will not serve your gods or worship the image of gold you've set up. Ninety feet high, that image. Nine feet wide. The pressure must have been intense. This is no children's story. It's horrifying. They're going to be burned alive. And the awful furnace stood ready like a, it was beehive shaped, made of metal, commentators believe. We're going to throw you in if you don't bow the knee. But they refused. They stood firm in wonderful, dynamic, crazy faith. They're respectful, but they refused to apologize for their actions. And they really believe that God is powerful in their moment of trial. They say, our God is able to deliver us from the furnace. The Hebrew text there means he is infinitely able to rescue us. But then they make one of the most remarkable statements. They say, God is able, but even if he doesn't, <laughs> even if he doesn't deliver us, we're still not going to bow the knee. He can, but even if he doesn't, we are not going to submit to you, Nebuchadnezzar. Some Christians almost despise it when people pray prayers that include, if it's your will, Lord, if it be thy will. They say, that's weak. I don't think so. In Gethsemane, Jesus prayed one of those, Father, not my will, but your will be done prayers. And that's what these Hebrew lads are doing. They are not gambling their faith on a specific outcome. Well, we'll trust God as long as he does this. No, they're saying God is big and able, but whatever the outcome, we're going to trust him anyway. Pastor George Ross says this. He said, I've served in the ministry for 31 years, and I've come to understand that there are two kinds of faith. One says, if everything goes well, if my life is prosperous, if I'm happy, if nobody I love dies, if I'm successful, then I'll believe in God, say my prayers, go to church and give what I can afford. The other says, though the cause of evil prosper, though I sweat in Gethsemane, though I must drink my cup at Calvary, nevertheless, precisely then I will trust the Lord who made me. So Job cries, though he slay me, yet I trust him. And as I think about our Timberline family, I think 
Some of our greatest heroes of faith are the heroes who have demonstrated faithfulness when the outcome that they prayed for, when the healing that they sought to help them out of that wheelchair, it hasn't come yet. But they have not gambled their faith on the outcome. Instead, they have said, whatever happens, God help me, I'm going to trust Him. I pray in my own life that God will settle that kind of faithful determination in my own heart and keep my feet steady when everything seems like an earthquake all around. Well, the last thing to conclude is this, and that is we lift our heads and we see the King of glory by faith. You see, because Daniel needed hope, God gave him a vision of the Son of Man, Daniel 7. In my vision at night, I looked, and there before me was one like a son of man, coming with the clouds of heaven. He approached the ancient of days and was led into his presence. He was given authority, glory, and sovereign power. All nations and people of every, of every language worshipped him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion that will not pass away, and his kingdom's one that will never be destroyed. Who did Daniel see when he was in the big city of Babylon? He saw Jesus. Son of man was a term that Jesus frequently used to describe himself and it drove the religious leaders nuts, insane with rage. Stephen, one of the, the church's first martyrs, in the book of Acts, the early part of it, he's being stoned to death, a horrible death. And he looks up and he says, I see the Son of Man. You see, in that critical moment of pressure and pain and death, Daniel, or rather like Daniel, Stephen was treated to this incredible vision of the Son of Man. And Daniel celebrates God's wisdom, his power. He says he changes the times and the seasons. He says God knows what's in the darkness. In his own darkness, Daniel, by faith, looks up and sees the risen Christ. And we turn to the book of Revelation, chapter 1. And John says, I turned around to see the voice that was speaking to me. And when I turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And among the lampstands was someone like a son of man, dressed in a robe, reaching down to his feet and with a golden sash around his chest. The hair on his head was white like wool, as white as snow. His eyes were like blazing fire. His feet were like bronze glowing in a furnace. His voice like the sound of rushing waters. In his right hand, he held seven stars. Coming out of his mouth was a sharp double-edged sword. His face was like the sun shining in all its brilliance. When I saw him, I fell at his feet as though dead. Then he placed his right hand on me and said, do not be afraid. I am the first and the last. I am the living one. I was dead and look, I am alive forever and ever. I don't want this to sound like some kind of theological religious cliche. But we can say this with confidence. When everything else is uncertain and when we feel ourselves hemmed in by question marks, God give us the ability by faith to look up and realize that the Son of Man stands unshaken by everything that is going on around the planet today. His purposes will come to pass. The book of Revelation is not a timetable for us to speculate about. Rather, it is a beautiful drama that says to us, hey, God's people, whatever's going on, in the end, God wins and his purposes will prevail. So this week, Let's think about how we perhaps might nurture hope in our lives. That might involve, for me it certainly is involving at this time, a deeper immersion into Scripture. What kind of, what kind of church going online or in person really nurtures hope? Because I think it's possible to be involved in church but not really be energized by it because there's a a lack of worshipping, participation, serving or giving. Perhaps this week we could ask God to give us a greater vision 
of the second coming of Christ. Maybe it is that we are choosing to trust God whatever rather than for a preferred outcome. In a few moments from now, I'm going to be praying, leading us in prayer. But before we do that, I'd love to share with you a, a piece of worship music, uh, a beautiful song, and the arrangement of this song is shared by a worship team from a church that I work with in the UK, Life Central Church in House Owen near Birmingham in England. Here's what I'd love us to do right now, wherever you are, just sit back and soak in the truth that however dark the darkness is, the light has come. And as you hear these words, perhaps to say to God, I want that to be my story. Whatever waves I have to walk on, whatever seas need to part, my story is going to be a story that declares God never fails. Before we go to the music, let me also say, if you're not a follower of Jesus, this could be the moment, even as you listen and soak up these truths, to say, God, be my God right now in Jesus' name.